excerpt was taken from the Full and Bloom interview with guitarist Mark Ferrari. You can listen to the entire interview. Click the link in the description. How did you meet Ron Keel? Well, that story's been told a few times, but I'll tell it again. Uh, it was through Mike Varney, and uh, interesting story. When I was 18 years old, I submitted a demo to Mike Varney. He had that column in Guitar World magazine that featured on discovered guitar players, and you know, a lot of great players have been featured in there, guys like Inve and Billy Sheen and Richie Cotson and Paul Gilbert and I think Lou Saraceno. I'm probably missing a few. But anyways, I submitted a demo to Mike when I was 18 years old. And uh, from that point in time, we became pen pals and then phone pals, but I never met him. I moved out to Los Angeles in early 84, and I was shopping for a jacket that had been I had a leather jacket was stolen from me up at the Rainbow. And I'm shopping for a jacket down on Melrose, and I turn around, and I see this guy, and it's Mike Varney. <laughs> you know? I, so I ran into him at this store, and uh, I had moved out to, to Los Angeles to join three guys in my cover band in Boston. They moved out ahead of me. But those three guys left. They went back to Boston. I wasn't moving back. And so I told Mike, you know, I had been out here for a while. Does he know anything going on? And he told me that Ron Keel was uh, going to, you know, he was going to kind of break up Steeler finally and form his own thing called Keel. And that's how we were introduced, was through Ron, and that's through uh, Mike Varney. And uh, that's how it happened, was, was through Mike. And once Keel got going, things happened pretty fast. You know, our first show was in April of 84. And by June of 84, we were recording Lay Down the Law. And then two months later, literally two months after we finished that record, we were in the studio with Gene Simmons. So I know you want to ask about that album, but we did not have a lot of time to prepare for that record. And as you may know, there's actually only three new songs on the Right to Rock, Keel songs. And we redid three. There's a, a couple of Gene Simmons songs, and then there's the Stones cover that we did. So that's why we only had three new songs on the Right to Rock that, uh, you know, weren't covers uh, or redos because we literally had to jump in the studio with Gene. Gene had a very short window to do that record. And it was take it or leave it, and so we decided to take it. <laughs> Lay Down the Law came out in November of 84, and then you released the Right to Rock in January of 85? Yeah. That's incredible. Well, we, didn't, we, we didn't have any control over those releases. You know, I actually, I thought the uh, Lay Down the Law came out a little bit earlier, maybe October, but if you're saying November, maybe it was. But yeah, the three, the three new songs that are on the Right to Rock are the title track, Back to the City, and Electric Love. We redid Let's Spend the Night Together, uh, Speed Demon, and You're the Victim, and then we had the three Gene Simmons songs. There's only nine songs on that album. When we did an interview like 15 years ago, really all that stuff's kind of an archive site now, but I'd still like to kind of get this along with the story. Can you tell me about the first time you met Ron Kill? Hey, I was uh, renting an apartment. Uh, I believe it was on Clark Street or uh, one of those streets over there by the Rainbow. And, uh, you know, he picked me up in this Trans Am. And I thought, wow, look at this rock star. He's got his long hair and his shades. He's driving his uh, sports car. He was living with uh, his uh, soon-to-be wife, uh, Dee Dee, who was a beautiful woman. I said, hey, man, this guy's, this, you know, this, this guy's got it all, you know? That was the start of our friendship and our, our working relationship that day. Um, and I remember I actually went to the last, Steeler show. The very last Steeler show was down in San Diego, and uh, I think Kurt James was the last guitar player that he had. And was I Greg believe, Jason uh, the bass player? Yeah, Greg was the bass player, and Bobby Marks, who came along to be in Keel, was right. the drummer. Yeah, so like Ron was showing me off as the new kid. That was a that was a distinct memory too. Very very early on, I met Ron. It must have been late February or early March of '84. But again, things happen pretty quick. He had management. He already had a following in Los Angeles. And uh, our first show was at Perkins Palace in Pasadena, over 1,500 kids. You know, it was 
it was off to the races pretty quick. Yeah, not a bad way to start. And then David Michael Phillips from King Cobra is in the band at that time, right? Yeah, David was the first uh, the, the first of the co-guitars. The original original Keel lineup, which only lasted one show, was me and Dave, Kenny Chase on, Bobby Marks, and Ron. So actually, I'm the only one left out of that lineup that's still with Keel, because Kenny's not doing Keel anymore, and Dwayne Miller replaced Bobby in uh, the summer of 84, and Brian Jay replaced uh, David. Uh, yeah, David, um, great player, nice guy, but I, I guess he was just kind of betting that Carmine Apathy was going to uh, have a a quicker trajectory than us. Well, I uh, thought the initial kind of breakup is when Ron gets announced as the singer for Black Sabbath. Is that when he left, or was it a different time? No, you're correct. After the first show, Ron announced that he had the gig. I think the Sabbath guys uh, came to the show, from what I remember. And uh, but that uh, came and went pretty quickly. Uh, but maybe that factor in the Dave's decision. I actually auditioned for Lita Ford after Ron announced he was uh, he got the Sabbath gig. So we were all, all kind of scrambling to do other things. And I remember auditioning for Lita Ford. And I wanted that gig so much because she was a huge star and she was getting ready to go to Europe and it was a salary and everything like that. We were looking for somebody to play keyboards and I, uh, I, I was not that guy. But everything happens for a reason and Ron came back to the roost and we all, we, we all, we all came back and held it together. We had a little scare there, I guess, but uh, everything worked out okay. So Brian J comes in pretty quick after that? Yeah. Again, that's, you're going back 36 years. Some of the dates are a little foggy uh, with me, but I, I believe that would have been that would have been correct. But after Ron uh, told us he didn't have the gig, um, we needed another guitar player. We wanted another guitar player, and that's when we found Brian. Now, at the beginning of the recording, uh, drummer Bobby Marks left the Man, why did he leave? Well, he didn't leave in the beginning of the recording. Uh, he actually recorded on the right to rock and was replaced after. So, oh wow, I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure the credits uh, reflect that Bobby played on there, and there was additional percussion by Dwayne Miller. Um, let's see if I can find my right to rock. Yeah, I thought uh, Steve Riley was credited to as. Oh the yes, you, that that is correct. I got all my drummers mixed up here. <laughs> uh, yeah, Stephen Stephen played you're absolutely correct. Stephen played the drums on the right to rock. Bobby was so <laughs> funny. We had three different drummers on three different albums, right? We had uh, Bobby Marks on uh, Lay Down the Law. We had Stephen Riley who did the bulk of the uh, recording on the right to rock and then the uh, final frontier and keel were uh, were Dwayne. Uh, yeah, I'm looking at the uh, I'm looking at the uh, it says additional drums and vocals by Stephen Riley and Dwayne Miller drums and vocals, but my recollection is that it was it was Stephen's tracks. They should have been reversed actually, but Dwayne was you know Dwayne was uh, a member of the band by the time we shot the album you know, the album cover for uh, for that. But was it Bobby's decision to leave the band or was he fine? I don't think so. I think I think it was Ron's decision. Ron and Bobby had a long history to together, yeah. dating back to Steeler. I think that Ron felt that um, Bobby wasn't ready to make the move up to the majors uh, with us. He, he was great as a AAA player, but wasn't ready to make the move up to the majors. But uh, Bobby was like my best friend in the band, and so, you know, he, used to, he was the guy I was closest to uh, friend-wise, and I didn't have a car for a while, so he was, uh, he was my taxi, you know, so... <laughs> But, uh, yeah, you'd have to ask Ron what his thinking was back then. When we did an interview years ago, you had said that you hadn't really heard anything. Have you heard anything from him nowadays? From Bobby? Yeah. I actually saw him about... Uh four or five years ago because he's living up in Santa Barbara now and I, I went up I spent the weekend up there uh, beach camping with my uh, daughter and my wife and uh, he came down to have lunch with me I don't know if he's playing anymore but uh, he's on Facebook so you know once in a while he pops up pops up uh, in my feed but I don't think he you know, after, after Keel I don't really think he did much of anything in the music space 
Barry Brandt from Angel actually comes in first, yeah. right? Yeah, Barry, Barry, I think he was hired. I remember rehearsing with him, but then he started taking some time off. Like, yeah, you know, we were in the middle of uh, production here for, for the Right to Rock album. And again, we just had this narrow window to do this album. And I just remembered, like, he, he wouldn't come to rehearsal. He had, he had to do something this day, and the next day he had to do something else. And it was, it just came apparent that this was not his this was not his uh, main focus and again you know he was in a semi big band that had four records out already and a fair amount of touring and you know, he had already was a rock star and here he was in this band that hadn't even recorded its first major label album yet so uh that was not a good fit so and then uh did the record with with steven now, i don't know you know the funny thing is i don't know why Dwayne. i don't know why Dwayne wasn't considered you know right off the bat why did we get Dwayne in when we let bobby go why do we uh, uh hire steven i don't Dwayne maybe wasn't on the radar yet i'm not sure that that would be a wrong question fred in corey fact, from cinderella was there for a brief moment yeah, as well fred, right? was, fred was in there too fred was in there really early because um, I would, Fred stayed with me. Fred stayed with me, and uh, you know, Fred and I continue a friendship today. But I don't think I think Fred wasn't quite used to, to Ron's. Uh, you know, again, Ron was kind of like a drill sergeant back in the day. Not saying anything negative. It was just the way he was. He was very focused and very serious. Ron was very very serious, and I think that that style kind of um, kind of rubbed Fred the wrong way. So he, he didn't last that long with, with our band, maybe a couple of weeks. And then after the recording, or at least when the drums are done, Steve Riley leaves to join Wasp. Are there any... That's correct. Yeah, yeah we, we played a couple of shows with Steve. There's actually some photos out there. I remember Burn Magazine came out. I think we played the uh, Sam, played out in San Bernardino uh, Civic Center out there, or... Um, Somewhere out there. I know Burn came out there. So there, there was, we played a couple of shows with, with uh, uh, Steve. Uh, but yeah, that's when he, uh, you know, I guess he was kind of just rolling the dice that, you know, Wasp was already signed to Capitol and uh, they may have already had a record out uh, in late uh, 85. I'm not sure, but that was his decision to. Uh, the jump ship. Yeah, actually, I think he joined on the, he did the tour for the first Wasp record. Riley shows would have been in the summer of 84. Don't forget, our album wasn't even scheduled to come out till right. January of 85, and none of us were making any money back then. There's just no money, so I'm sure that kind of factored into his decision. Are there any Steve Riley moments that stand out? Uh, he was a funny guy. He, he, he again, uh, he, he was my bud in the band. He was from Boston. He had just, you know, he's just a very gregarious, outgoing guy with a wonderful sense of humor. I, I really took to him a lot. So, uh, and we didn't have a lot of time together. Just, you know, just a matter of months, really. We started recording The Right to Rock, I believe, in, I'm going to guess it was August of 84. And I can't recall if those shows were before or after the gig. Uh, after the recording, we didn't have a lot of time with, with him. You know, I'm, I'm guessing maybe three months, three to four months uh, in, in and out, Stephen. But I love the guy. <laughs> he was great. Two. <laughs> 